We are ready to get rolling again. Got plenty to go. <laughs> I'm 16 slides into 61 that I have, so I don't know. We'll just see where we go tonight. And, uh, plenty to go. Um, first off, just as a, as a you know, status check, is this kind of information actually helpful to you as we've been looking at this? Is rewarding? Um, I, again, I... All books are challenging to start, you know, to kind of get started. You, know, you just pick up a book, you know, the Bible, and you start reading it. Well, what's the background? What, you know, how do you get really started with it? Genesis is like, oh, how do you start this book? It's so comprehensive and so foundational and so important. Um, and so, you know, I just, hopefully this is, again, you seem to indicate it is uh, beneficial to you to get the background so it can really get moving. We'll get lots of traction as we go. We'll probably spend a lot of time in Genesis 1, you know, several weeks at least, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, but um, it's so hard to know from a, from a teacher standpoint, hard to know where you get started with a book like this because it's so, so in-depth and so rich and so important that we lay the right foundation. Um, and one of the reasons why I decided to do Genesis is some people have asked me on various times, you know, what's a good commentary on the book of Genesis? And, I, and I, I'm not trying to be prideful here, but I just have not found one I would recommend um, as an excellent, excellent resource on that, and so um, I was looking at our website and kind of the various teachings that we've done, and I went, I don't have one on Genesis. I've taught it three or four times in the past, but I don't have any material, and I don't have any recordings or anything like that that's out there, and so I'm not say, claiming to be the best of anything, but I you know, felt like people asked me, well, I really want to study the book of Genesis. I, can't, I just didn't have any particular commentary. I went, well, this is the perfect one, you know, like, like with mere Christianity or, you know, I don't, have, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I'm like, well, yeah, sure, those are good books, and there's a few other things that I could recommend. But as a commentary, as a study on the book of Genesis, I just went, mm, I just, they're not, none of them are quite meeting to the standards I want. So I'm hoping I can make one here through this series that I'm actually saying I think I like it, um, both from a handouts, notes perspective, as well as what we put online. So that's my hope and prayer and objective. We'll see how well it all comes together. All right, so a couple more things before we go. Uh, major, or get into the Genesis 1, 1, major themes. So here's what you're going to see is major themes within the book of Genesis. Obviously, creation week. In fact, that's why we have a seven-day work week in virtually all cultures for the last 6,000 years. I've had a seven-day week because of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, the fall, in, and that's, I capitalize that because it's one event, it's an actual the definitive event, the fall of sin, or into sin, which then corrupted man, and, but also corrupted all of creation, and that includes the stars of this, and, the, and the universes and the galaxies and all of that. Everything in God's creation was corrupted when man fell into sin in the garden. Man's wicked rebellion and God's judgment against man's wickedness and rebellion and sin or major themes in the book. God's covenant. God is a, pro, a, a God who makes covenants. He makes promises, and he delights. He, he, he declares himself the only being in the universe who always perfectly keeps his covenants and his promises. Okay? He, he, lights, he delights in being a God who keeps promises. Um, so Noah and the great flood are, are huge. It's so foundational to science and history and, 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 you know, and anthropology of you all, the study of man. It, it, the, Noah and the flood is absolutely essential. We get that one right. And, but, and, and it's a major theme. Uh, Abraham's call and the blessing of this father of faith. We have the father of the faithful. We still today call Abraham the father of faith. It's so important we learn about this in, very important historical figure in our, our, our heritage. Okay, especially as believers. Uh, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So important to understand. Now, this man was not, no one would describe Jacob as perfect or close to perfect, but he did somewhat redeem himself, if you will, by, putting, by showing a demonstration of faith as he progressed through a life of kind of rebellion and, and narcissism towards a life of faith in the end. And we see that in those promises and those prophecies in chapters 48 through 50. Um, Joseph, uh, so, and then Joseph, the beloved and faithful son who delivers his people after he's betrayed by his brothers. Um, and I will tell you that, you know, <laughs> I told you that I didn't know anything about the Bible. 
and I started, you know, I started trying to read the Gospels or the New Testament. I went, I have to read Genesis first and all that. Well, I, I started reading about the, story, the life of Joseph. I went, oh, this man is one of the most important figures. Obviously, everything links back to Joseph. And I go, and I started reading more and I went, oh, almost nothing links, links back to Joseph. He's a great figure, but he doesn't have a, a, a thread that connects him to the Messiah, right, and Christ and all of that. I went, oh, wow, I was surprised by that. Yeah. No, I mean, no, they're, they're not from like one from each tribe or anything like that. No. But God does like the number 12 yeah. okay. in, in this. So 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel. It will see that uh, Esau, what's that? 12 months, of the year. 12 months of the year. Esau, Jacob's brother, also had 12 sons and all. God likes the number in that, that sense. But no, the, the 12 tribes are not the same as the 12 disciples by you know, any linkage or connection to them. Okay. All right, um, and then I mentioned this already, but let's go through this for a moment. Uh, the, you'll see, we'll see these, now I've got to count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, I think it is, or 11. Um, 11 times here in the book of Genesis... We have the phrase uh, the, in Hebrew. I, don't, I shouldn't say Hebrews. I think I should just say Hebrew. Uh, the word in Hebrew is toledoth. Okay, and it, you would say this is the history of, or this is the genealogy of, or this the history of something, right? And so these are introductory, and telling us this is the history of an important event that God wants all people to know. And so the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. That phrase is used in Genesis 2-4. He gives us the creation week as a big picture of what happened on six days of creation and one day of rest. But then as he comes back, he wants to talk about, talk about man, mankind, woman, and marriage, and all of that. He says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth in the day that they were created, in verse 2-4. Then he says, this is the history of Adam in chapter 5, verse 1, and that's the 10 generations that go to Noah. And then in verse 6, 9, he says, this is the Toledoth, or this is the history of Noah. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, I remember I keep saying this is the table of nations, this is the history of the sons of Noah, the Toledoth. Then he says in chapter 11, verse 10, a more specific one, because this is the nation, or the son of Noah, that the nation of Israel came out of. It's important for they know a little bit more information about their own history from Shem. This is the history of the Toledoth of Shem. Then he says this is the history of Terah, which is really Abraham, Abraham's father. So it's really the history of Abraham, even though it kind of leads off with his father. We know almost nothing about his father, right? But we do know this is the history of Abraham in verse eleven twenty-seven. 27. Then he says this is the history of Isaac, in chapter 25, verse 19. Then this is the history of Edom and Esau, the two, two nations that are two people, sons that come together, chapter 36. And then finally, the book closes with this is the history of Joseph, right? And so if we back up again, I, from a, I've said this before, but I want to reinforce it here. If this is the history of Jacob um, and Joseph, really, he was a real person. Real evidence, real, real history. Same with Esau, same with Isaac, same with Abraham, same with Shem, same with Noah, same with Adam, the same with creation. You see, he's using that same phrase. Now, most of the religious groups on the planet, well, three, the, at least the three dominant ones, don't have any problem with Abraham starting there in verse, uh, really, verse, and maybe even Noah, but starting in verse eleven, ten, chapter 11, verse 10, history of Shem, history of Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all say, yeah, that's real history. That's all real history. Now, Islam wants to separate after Abraham and say that Ishmael was the real son and all of that goes along with that. But the three most dominant religions on the planet, faith groups, whatever you want to prefer to call them, all agree that the history of Shem and, and Abraham are real history. The Jews have long held, and they're well supported by archaeological discovery, that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph are all real histories too. 
So again, why are we questioning the same book that uses the same phrase as to whether or not Noah was a real man who, in the account of the flood that he endured, was a real event, or the history of the creation of the heavens and the earth? The same phrase is used throughout the book with no change, and yet there's, you can find plenty of books in Christian libraries or Christian bookstores that talk about, oh, you know, it's, it's mytho-history. It's just, a, you know, Adam and Eve are just kind of typological people, and, you know, they don't have any relationship to history. I consider it junk. I consider it woodpile and, and fireplace material. Um, just doesn't have any value to me, right? So it's, it's, I just want you to see, this is the phrase that's used, what, there's 10 or 11 times in the book of Genesis that this is the history of God wants you and I, just like he wanted Israel of, of ages past, to know this is the history of the heavens and the earth. This is the history of Adam. This is the history of Noah. This is the history of Shem, Ham, J Japheth, and all of that. Okay. So, uh, the history of creation. So the Genesis 1 and 2, here's the overview of what we're going to get into in this next section okay, of our study. The history of creation, chapters 1 and 2. This is where definitively we find creation a given information to us by the creator himself. So Genesis 1 focuses on the six literal days of creation plus one day of rest. And I didn't, I didn't put the reference there, but Exodus verse, chapter 20, verse 11 God specifically says that he made the heavens and the earth in six literal days, and he rested on the seventh day. So Israel is, in, is commanded by law to also rest on their seventh day, which clearly indicates God tells us, I want you to understand, I created in six literal 24-hour days, or maybe some approximation of there's some kind of change from the fall that would make it a slightly different, but not much. It's literal days, six literal days plus one literal day of rest. And we'll talk about what that rest means and all that when we get there. Genesis chapter 2 focuses on day 6 of creation, how God created Adam and then Eve. They were unique among all of his creation. They're not like the chimpanzees or the orangutans or, you know, the other, you know, uh, what's, what's it, not apes or whatever of the ape, ape, trying to think of the classification, um, or, yeah, you know, or trees, or insects, or dolphins, or fish, or anything else. God focuses on, why would God focus so much on man and not any other creature? Because we're made in his image. We are the central aspect of all of history that God wants to bring about redemption to his people. So Genesis 1 details how God established, we'll see this as we go, an increasing level of order. You might recall the phrase in chapter 1, verse 2, the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered or brooded over the waters, right? God says, look, I created, but I want, I want you to understand, I first there was nothing, and then I created, but it was formless and void. It's like a, almost like a blank canvas that needs information, needs design in order to be added to it for it to become its intended purpose. And so day one, he adds a step of order, but it's not complete. Day two, he adds more order, but it's not complete. Day three, he adds more order, but it's still not complete. And day four, and day five, and day six, and then he gets to day seven and says, it's done, it's fully ordered, it's unified, it's perfect, it's well suited for my intended purpose. It's very good, he declares. And then he rested now, why, people always want to know, why did he do it in six days? Why didn't he just breathe everything out in one second? Because God wanted us to have a calendar that was centered around seven days with six dedicated to man doing man type things and the seventh of man doing God things. We focus on God, our relationship with God, at least this one day out of the week. Right? So he did it for a purpose. It's a pattern, it's order, it's structure. And that's how he communicated it to us, by actually doing it in six days, in resting on the seventh. Then Genesis chapter 2 details how God transferred dominion over creation immediately from him, the creator, to man, the created being, but created in God's image. And we'll, we'll see that unfold as it goes. 
So Genesis 1 details how God created and established man and, wo- and woman, I should say woman, not women, in his image, or maybe it should say men and women, in his image with equal moral value, men and women with each other, and above all of creation. Okay? They're all created in God's image, man and woman. Genesis 2 details how God established the man or the husband to be the head of the woman, the head of the home. Genesis 1 explains how God directly created man and women in, a woman in his image. It's really considered the crowning achievement. Later on in Scripture, he calls us the apple of his eye. Right? Crowning achievement of creation. Genesis 2 explains how the first man and the first woman uniquely came into existence. Each of their origins were different from each other even. Were uniquely brought to life by God's direct, creative, and life-giving actions. See, there's a difference between chapter 1 and chapter 2. So, um, and, and there is, we'll talk about it, but there is, there's this, again, more speculation slash heresy out there that Genesis 1 and chapter 2 contradict each other. Oh, well, different things happen in chapter, you know, in Genesis chapter one or chapter one on day six than chapter two describes. So clearly Moses was confused and wrote two different stories of creation. No, no, no. We'll talk about that. He, cre- he talked about the orderly six days of creation. That, that communicates one specific purpose from disorder to order. And day six, chapter two, focuses on exactly how God wanted to establish mankind as having dominion and authority and uniqueness among all of creation. And so he gives us an expanded description of that event. Okay? And, and we do that kind of stuff all the time. You know, we might say, yeah, you know, last week, my family and I, we went, went over to the west side of the state and we, we you know, we, we toured the rainforest. And then you go, well, what, is that all you did? And then, you know, I say, that, that's what I did. And then later on, I'll say, oh, no, but we also did X, Y, and Z, and blah, 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 and this happened and that happened. I can give you more details, but I wasn't lying of what we did. I just didn't give you details. The second time you asked me, well, give me some more information. He, I give you more information about what my family did last week, and this is literally what happened. We were over there traveling. But, we, you know, I'm not lying when I say we went there, we went to the Olympic Peninsula, on vacation. Chapter 2 in Genesis gives us more details on the specific day that man was created. So the opening two chapters represent a common literary style in Hebrew, where the overview is presented first, followed by a more detailed, narrow focus on that which follows. We see this also uh, exactly happening in chapters 10 and 11 in the book of Genesis. Chapter 10 tells us this is how we've spread all the nations out through the table of nations, the 70 nations that came out from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Chapter 11 says, well, let me tell you why God made that happen. Because man tried to build a tower out of his own pride and arrogance, and God says, let us go down there and disrupt them and spread them across the globe and and confuse their language. That's not a contradiction. It's just that The first chapter gave us the big picture overview. The second chapter that follows, chapter 11, will tell us, well, this is why God did it, and and the specifics of how that that dispersion happened from the Tower of Babel. Um, The reunion of Moses and Aaron in Exodus chapters 3 and 4 shows a similar pattern. Like, if if you're reading that, it's like, well, did Aaron, how many times did Aaron come out to meet Moses? Well, he's chapter 3, he says, look, Moses... You, you, want it, you, want, you, know, you, you refuse to be the spokesperson. You think you're not a very good speaker. Okay, well, your brother Aaron's going to be your spokesperson. He says, look, he's coming. Well, then it's not to chapter 4 we actually see when Moses and Aaron actually meet. But he tells us the big picture and then follows with the more specific. And you find this all through Scripture. Big picture followed by detailed picture. It's, there's nothing, there's no contradiction between Genesis 1 and 2. So the notion that Genesis 1 and 2 represent a contradiction, uh, to me, belies an an ignorance of this ancient style of writing that's clearly evident through Scripture and extra-biblical writings of the day. And And it holds the author of Scripture, God himself as well as Moses, to standards 
that were never intended to be met. Oh, I'm going to force you to tell me all the information in the first section so that the second section never looks like a difference. Not at all. All right. Past that. Cause, but you'll, again, you'll hear that kind of stuff. Oh, haven't you ever, you know, how can you believe in the Bible? Genesis 1 and 2 don't even agree with each other. Okay, why don't you study your Bible? Why don't you study ancient writings? Why don't you study how things like this are communicated in, a- times, uh, in ancient times or in Hebrew literature? Anyway, Genesis 1 1. Let's, we're actually going to make it in, at least into Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I don't know, if based on now 22 of 61 slides I have, we're probably not going to make it all the way through. But here we go. Uh, Genesis 1 1, this is in, that's in Hebrew. You all probably, without even trying, have already memorized Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? Most of you probably already have it, could say it for the rest of your life. Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, Genesis 1 1, again, Hebrew reads from right to left. So the first little thing over there on the right for you is Bereshit, and the second word is Bara, and the third word is Elohim. Then there's a couple of, there's an et, there's a connecting little phrase in there we don't really pronounce in Hebrew. And then hashameim, or the heavens. And then another connecting conjunction there. And then ha'aretz, meaning the earth. And so, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what it looks like in Hebrew. And I, and I put spaces in there so I could read it better, as well as maybe you. It's really squished all together in the original writings, with actually no vowel points on the top and the bottom and all that. So let's talk about this incredible verse. This is an incredible verse. I don't know how, many, how I can say it any, any stronger. This is incredible. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, this sentence is, listen to this. this I think this it gives significance to its importance. Listen to this. And I've shared this before in a couple of places. But the Hebrew is constructed of seven words and 28 letters. Notice that seven and 28 are multiples of seven. Seven times four is 28. So there's seven words. That's a, that's a multiple of seven times one. The number of letters is 28. That's four times seven. The number of uh, or in words one through three, in the beginning God created, is 14 letters. That's two by seven. Words four through seven, the heavens and the earth, okay, um, are 14 letters. That's two times seven. Words four and five are seven letters. Words six and seven are seven letters. The key nouns, God, heaven, and earth, are 14 letters, or 2 times 7. The remaining non-nouns are 14 letters, that's 2 by 7. Does that seem at all random? Does that seem at all like somebody intended to communicate underneath, like put a fingerprint right there and said, this verse has significance, pay attention to it. Every aspect that you can imagine of that phrase, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, is a multiple of seven. Now, have you ever figured out that God seems to like the number seven also? Even more than the number 12, right? And others. Within Scripture, there, you know, there's this kind of sense that numbers, whether we've figured out every single one of them or not, numbers seem to have significance, don't they? Seven, well, se- the, the creation week itself, seven days. God seems to like the number seven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Every aspect of that phrase and that word and that sentence is divisible by seven in one form or another. Now we start to understand, wait a minute, God created in seven days because he likes the number seven, and he likes the number seven so much that every, practically every culture and every generation for 6,000 years has a seven-day work week or seven-day week on a calendar. Okay. Yeah? The idea that God is so amazing that he chose to create a language mm-hmm. that he uses Right, of the intelligence, the intelligence, the power, the foreknowledge, the purpose yeah. of God. And the ability to think all that through mm-hmm. and have no errors. <laughs> Far intelligence that my brain can't even begin to, not even close. And people have done computer analysis. There's, there's, this is just one of thousands of you know kind of things that you can look at like this. 
Uh, but they've done computer analysis. The statistical improbability of just accidentally writing a sentence like this in any language is into the millions or, or greater that you would ever do this by accident. Okay. Ever. It's, just, it's, just, it's, it's, it's basically statistically a miracle that you could write a cogent, coherent sentence that would have this kind of characteristics that seems to underlie a proof and a purpose that someone more intelligent than man in, in computers could have written. Okay. It would take lots of processing power to figure out how to make that work if the language itself didn't try to support it. And again, this is just one of thousands of underlying kind of proofs that God is actually the author of Scripture. And so the first verse of the Bible, very first verse of the Bible, screams to those who are willing to investigate it, Hello, I'm super special, I'm really important, I'm divinely inspired. Listen, listen, listen to me. Don't sit there and question, well, you know, whether to... I wrote this verse to give you confidence and hope and understanding that my intelligence, my wisdom, my purposes, my plans so far exceed whatever your mind can conceive that it's time to submit rather than resist the wisdom and power and authority of God. The very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, in the beginning, everything in the created universe had a miraculous beginning. There is no really debate about that. You can talk to as many atheistic, secular scientists as you want and keep asking them, how did, the, how did nothing come into something? And they will all say, well, you know, uh, you know, and they, they don't have an answer. They can't possibly even speculate an answer other than trying to do the whole multiverse kind of thing. But even that, it's always kicking the can down the road, right? It's, well, this universe can't create itself. You can't take nothing and suddenly have everything. So a different universe created this universe. It, it exploded and created this universe. Well, where did that universe come from? Oh, well, a different universe created that universe, or you got this multiverse engine out there that keeps spitting out universes all over the place. Well, where did the engine come from? Where did that come from? It's always just, trust me, it could happen. The reality is, everything in the created universe had a beginning, and we know from logic that everything that has a beginning had a cause that brought it into existence. The only explanation is God when you ultimately get down to the brass tacks of everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something. Right, yeah, exactly. You just redefine the definition of nothing that's something else. Right. Nothing really means nothing. No time. Well, let's look at it. Time, space, matter, energy, all had a simultaneous beginning. All of competent scientists in the last, you know, 200 years have affirmed that time, space, matter, and energy had a beginning. And that because they're interrelated, space and time are related Matter and energy are related, and they can't really exist without each other. They had to have a simultaneous beginning. Nothing means nothing. It's not like, like, like things or even God were wandering around something bigger and went, wow, look at this. There's an empty something. I'll put some stuff in it. Nothing means nothing. There was nothing there. You've heard other scientists go, well, you know, you have antimatter and matter, and they can kind of, you know, they kind of cancel each other out, and so, you know, it, it pops into existence, and blah, 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 blah. Well, antimatter and matter are something. Even if they cancel each other out, they're still something. There is no explanation outside of a divine, eternal, all-powerful God who exists with the ability and the power and the presence to create Secular scientists, will, I mean, when you push them, they'll always try to confuse you with lots of big words and lots of high priest kind of trust us, we know better than you. But in the end, they have no explanation of how you came, a, a finite universe 
came to have something rather than always be nothing. Or in, in the universe itself. How, it, it, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's not just emptiness. It's just it itself would have been nothing until time, space, matter, and energy came into being. So, as I said, God or anybody else did not find an empty universe to fill. He created the universe and all that's in it. We think about space as like, well, there's just nothing out there. And, oh, and God put a star here and a star there and a planet there and this, that, and the other thing. The universe itself didn't exist until Genesis 1-1 and God spoke it into existence. Since Einstein's general theory of relativity, uh, published in 1915... All responsible and competent scientists affirm the universe had a beginning. As I said, and Einstein hated this concept. He, he proved it's true. It's been proven. It's not just a theory anymore. He's proven that the universe had a beginning. But he hated that. He kind of created a cosmological constant to try and be a fudge factor to go, well, you know, I mean, you know, he ultimately said it was the biggest mistake of his life and could not come up with any reason to say, because a beginning requires a beginner. It implies a beginner. And he hated, like all atheists come to that with, hated the idea that a universe must have a beginner because it had a beginning. Right? Because this claim that first there was nothing and then there was everything, like Stephen Hawking wants to say, it can't possibly, it's illogical to the highest degree. It's mathematically impossible, it's scientifically impossible, it's philosophically impossible. You can't have nothing create something. It just, if it's nothing, it's nothing. It has no purpose, it has no substance, it has nothing that can, it can create from. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Some of you may hate this section of some science-y stuff. We'll talk about it in chapter one here and there and everywhere. And you can ask as many questions as you like. But let me just give you some basics. Again, I could, I could spend the entire next year just talking about, not even get into Genesis chapter one, verse two, but let me give you some basics to think about, Okay. The th there's three, you, go, you can go research this, there's three fundamental laws, I'll put them all in quotation marks because, we're, you know, it, it's what we experience today. Whether or not it was like this in, before the fall or before the flood, I can't tell you. But right now, science can observe three fundamental laws of what they call thermodynamics. You probably heard of this maybe at some point in time of your life, I don't know. This all point to the reality and the truth of Genesis 1-1. The first law is the conservation of energy. This, this law, scientific law that has nothing to do with Christianity, says this. The, the total energy of an isolated system, that would be our universe, is constant. Matter energy, one basic, you know, one form or another of the same concept, can be transformed one into another. For like, say, an atom into a nuclear explosion. That's a real rapid and powerful conversion of matter to energy. But it uh, can neither be created or destroyed. What you start with is what you get. Okay? The, it, these closed systems, like we have in this universe, you, you don't get to add new stuff to it. What you have is what you have. You can convert matter to energy. I don't know that you can convert energy to matter, but you can use matter to reform, or you can use energy to reform matter into different things. Okay? But you don't get to add anything new, and this is scientifically you know, a law that they've, they've declared it to be a law. You can't, if you have it, you can't add to it. So it, it, by, the fact that the universe is, cannot be self-created or have, have an a, a origin other than divine supernatural creation would violate the first law of thermodynamics. And most physicists, theoretical, theoretical physicists and all that, they know this, but they ignore it. Second law of thermodynamics is called entropy, sometimes also referred to as the bondage of decay. Everything wears out. Everything gets worse, not better over time. Okay. So the, they would, it would state that the, it recognizes the irreversibility of natural processes, meaning no intelligence, no, no divine force or anything like that, which tend towards what they call homogeneity. Does that mean? Like everything becomes it's the same, right? Eventually, everything will be, over time, all processes, all matter, all everything will simply become homogeneous, meaning there's nothing left. It's all one thing. Okay. So when matter and ener the matter and energy of, an energy of a universe, like ours, okay, reaches maximum entropy, it will cease to have energy available for work. And it doesn't mean work like 
go out and mow the lawn. It means like your cells in your body being able to actually process something and live, or a star having the ability to convert hydrogen or whatever it does into heat and light or whatever, right? Everything becomes dead. Cease to have energy available for work. This is also known as the heat death that scientists do project will occur over time. The third law deals with what's called absolute zero. So laws one and two are unchangeably moving towards the third law. You can't add new stuff. The system is closed. You can't add new matter. You can't add new energy to the system. Law number two says that matter and that energy are are working their way towards homogeneity. Law number three says that when they actually, without a miracle to intervene, once the universe reaches this condition, the first two laws cease to have any meaning because the universe is dead. It doesn't even exist anymore. Okay. That's the three laws of thermodynamics. Where in that can you come up with a hypothesis that says, well, but it created stars and planets and amoebas and DNA and people? None of this falls into that. In fact, every claim to the contrary is actually an a, a intended ignorance or willful uh, you know, a, you know, a willful, uh, uh, can't think of a word, just ig- ig- being, uh, ignoring the fact that these laws actually exist and that scientists truly believe they are real and purposeful and, and control the universe, okay, or control what can happen in the universe. So if the universe were eternally, or were eternal, which would, would violate what Einstein said, right, if an infinite number of days prior to today, we would already have reached absolute zero. If you claim otherwise, you don't understand infinity. Infinite number of days before today means that homogeneity would have already, the second law of thermodynamics entropy would have already occurred, the heat death would have already wiped us out because an eternal number of days means an eternal number of days, unceasing, never ending. It just keeps going and going and going and going and you keep doing it and it just keeps going. It never stops. We would be at homogeneity by definition. Because matter and energy cannot be added except by a miracle, the universe self-attests it must have had a supernatural origin. Because it doesn't have an unlimited number of days, and you can't add stuff into it. So it's obviously finite, and it would require a supernatural infusion of matter, energy, information to get it going in the first place. It self-attests to divine origin. Because all systems are subject to entropy, that remember law number two, entropy, there is no possibility that stars, planets, atoms, the periodic table of elements, cells, DNA, life could, could violate that second law, that entropy law, and move from disorder to order within or outside, without an outside force overriding or superseding the known laws of the universe. Hopefully that makes sense. Even if you're not a sciencey person, hopefully that kind of makes sense. You just can't do it based on what we know and observe and test within the universe that we live in. Even simple compounds, I'm going to put in quotes there, simple compounds or atomic structures when viewed with, a modern, with our current modern scientific tools that we have, reveal a level of complexity that goes beyond any probability or of accident or chance. Even scientists admit that the formation of these rare events would statistically constitute a miracle of any of these things. Okay. So I came across this article, um, I think about a year ago or somewhere within the last year, called Inside the Proton. And the, this is, again, secular scientists. This is absolutely not a Christian in the bunch, right? They call the proton the most complicated thing you could possibly imagine. That's the title of the article that they put out there. And you, I put the link in your notes. You can go to it and read it if you want. Let me read you a few quotes out of this. Okay. Has anybody like watched like, um, uh, Discovery Channel and uh, How the Universe Was Made, that kind of stuff? 
where it talks about all this stuff, and it talks about how in the first like billionth of a second of the universe, all this incredible stuff happened. More stuff happened in the first billionth of a second of the universe than has happened since that first billionth of a second kind of thing, right? Well, what happened there is they're going to say, well, you know, we, had, we need to have an atom. We need to have some, some stuff like hydrogen to make stars out of, right? Here's what they're saying. Just think about, I need an atom. I need an atom. The simplest atom that man knows about. Okay. So he says this. The, the, his point, so I want to point out. The positively charged particle at the heart of an atom is an object of unspeakable complexity. One that changes its appearance depending on how it is probed. We've attempted to connect the proton's many faces to form the most complete picture yet. They've been smashing atoms into each other in particle accelerators for decades. And their summation of their work is, this is the most complicated thing you can possibly imagine. No one will ever understand a simple atom. Okay. Second thing he said, more than a century after Ernest Rutherford discovered the positively charged particle at the heart of every atom, Physicists are still struggling to understand, fully understand the proton, which is, you know, the nucleus of the atom. Number three, this is the most complicated thing that you could possibly imagine, said Mike Williams, a physicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In fact, you can't even imagine how complicated this thing is. The proton has been humbling to humans, Williams said. Every time you think you have a handle on it, it throws you some curveballs. Now, without, an, without the hydrogen atom, the most simple atom on the planet, or on the, in the universe, you get nothing. You get nothing. You've got to figure out a way in your worldview to create the most complicated thing that po- mankind can't possibly even begin to imagine before anything else can happen in this hypothesized creation of the world. Okay, outside of God doing it. Let me show you this. You probably, see, you know what a, a, a hydrogen atom maybe looks like from your science classes or whatever. It's the most simple one, right? It's got one electron and one proton revolving around. Now, this is not to scale, by the way. Um, if I understand the, the dimensions or the scale properly, that electron is 100,000 times away from the center. It's huge. It's like, I think somebody said that I was listening to, if you put a golf ball on the goal line of a football field, the electron is at the other goal line, okay, that, in scale. It's huge, okay? So the, so the pro, and the proton is significantly larger than the electron and all that. But you've got to get this thing. You've got to get this electron and that proton. Simplest thing imaginable. It's the most abundant atom or element in the entire universe, okay? It's part of every star. It's part of our oxygen that we breathe. It's part of everything. Let me show you a quick little animation that that same article put out there of what they, after smashing atoms into each other for decades. This is the proton that they're having such a hard time describing. Does that look like it could form by accident? Does that look like it just, in the first billionth of a second of the universe, that that thing could just pop out? That's not even the atom, it's just the, that's the proton. You need the, you need the electron to, to add to it to make it something useful. That's the proton. You think that just happened in the first billionth of a second of the universe? Look at this animation, computer animation based on decades of trying to understand the proton and then create computer graphic models to explain it. And you saw what the man Williams said about how complicated this thing is. If you can't explain that through naturalistic accidental forces, you can't explain anything. Without that, no stars, no planets, no energy, no matter, nothing. But of course, that's just one element in the periodic tables of elements. And how did it all form? And how did it all come to be a planet? How did it all come to be the universe that we know and recognize and observe? Does that look at all accidental? All right. In Genesis, in the beginning, Genesis 1.1 is consistent. So Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know this phrase or this verse by heart now, okay, is consistent with the established rules of logic and reasoning that all human beings 
should have the capacity, or those who with the mental capacity, should recognize and understand, demand a proper explanation for our existence. Genesis 1-1 is consistent with, as if we've seen in like the, you know, the apologetics class we did a few, a few months ago, cosmological argument. The universe had a beginning. And the universe could not have caused itself. It can't self-create. And whoever or whatever caused the universe to exist must have existed before the universe and also possessed the power and the intelligence to bring it into existence. Genesis 1-1 declares that God is the uncaused first cause of the universe. That's entirely consistent with what we know about science and all that goes into it. Saying it created itself, even if the atom were simple, even if that proton was not as complicated as the most complicated thing you've ever seen in your life, or more complicated than you can imagine, even if it was super simple, you still can't logically say it created itself. But you can't say it created itself, and then when you look at it after spending billions of dollars and decades of smashing them into each other, you go, well, that thing is incredibly complicated. What does it tell you about the creation of the universe? Genesis 1-1 got it right all along. It's consistent with a teleological argument, meaning look at the end result of what you're seeing, like that proton in the graphics, right? The universe and all that it contains shows clear evidence of design. Every design requires a designer who possesses the intelligence and a purpose with which he created it. Well, unless you're talking about three on post-it notes or whatever. He created those by accident, right? So he's trying to create a glue that was super sticky and he got one that was very unsticky. But, you know, nevertheless, he put information and intelligence and energy into creating something. He got the wrong result that ended up making 3M billions of dollars for selling post-it notes. But you still need a designer, you didn't get post-it notes, didn't just create themselves, right? Randomness and chance never demonstrate purpose, never demonstrate intelligence, never in, 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 you know, indicate or show, demonstrate design. Genesis 1.1 declares that God brought incomprehensible levels of order and design into the universe by just speaking it into existence. God, this is the second word in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning was the first word. God Elohim is the second word. Elohim is plural in Hebrew. You, most of you probably have some level of recognition, like this em ending of a, like a seraph and a seraphim, a cherub and a cherubim. In Hebrew, for certain nouns, it becomes plural when you add the em ending to it. Elohim is plural. It really should be say gods. It's plural. Okay, so it's a but it's a singular noun. Um, for God was not used like El. Like you might say El is God and Elohim is gods. Okay. However, Hebrew has a what's called a dual noun construction. We don't have this in English. Dual meaning paired or two or something. It didn't use that for, word form either. It used God in a plural that always means three or more. Okay. So in the very first verse of the Bible, God introduces himself as a plural God. Okay. But just so that we're clear that it wasn't like a community of gods, Okay. The plural noun is syntactically paired with a singular verb created. This would be grammatically incorrect in Hebrew like it is in English. Like, I don't know, I'm, I'm so terrible at coming up with examples. Like, we goes to the store or something like that, right? It's, it's the wrong noun and verb combination, okay? It, it's, it's, it, this word is used, I can't remember now if I put it in here, it's used several hundred times, or maybe into the thousands of times, every time it's speaking of God in heaven, it's a plural noun with a singular verb, grammatically incorrect, except if God is a three-person unity, it's not grammatically incorrect. So scholars refer to this word Elohim as the plural majesty in reference to God. 
Sure, it can be when, when God, you know, or God or a prophet talks about how people are following, following false gods in the plural, it's not the plural majesty because it's the, it's the plural noun with the plural verb. But when it's talking about God in the plural majesty with the singular verb attached to it, we call it the plural majesty. Elohim, majesty of God, who is three, and we know from now, even in the Old Testament, we can see the Trinity. We can see God is one, but he's plural in his character and nature. Three persons in one God. Note the, 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 the truth or reality of God's existence Prior to the universe be created, he's assumed in the text. You will never find a place where God tries to defend his existence. Oh, well, where did God come from? He's not interested in answering that question. How do you answer a question that, that, that there is no answer to in the sense of he didn't come from anywhere? He is God. Moses said, who should I send you? And he says, I am that I am, which means I exist because I exist. If you didn't have a beginning, how can you tell people where you came from? He doesn't defend himself. He tells us, trust me, in Scripture, I'll give you multitudes of evidence upon compounded multitude of evidence that I am God. There is no one like me. There's no other. Don't bother asking where an uncreated, eternal being came from because he just is. And he always existed, and he's present everywhere, and there's no way to say, well, this is the origin of, of a being that doesn't have an origin. He doesn't answer the question because it's not important. What's important is that we know him, we trust him, we obey him, and we recognize him as our creator and ultimately also as our savior. So scripture scripture is constantly unburdened by the need to answer, where did God come from? It's not a valid question. It's not a logical question, right? I, I could go through that with you, you know, real quick. You know, I wish I had a piece of fruit. Pretend this, fruit, this phone is an, is an actual apple, not an apple device, right? Grew on a tree. Well, where, so where did the apple come from? Well, it grew on a tree. Well, where did the tree come from? Well, it came from a seed from a different apple. And where did that, well, where did that one come from? Well, it grew, and you just keep going back. Apple came from a tree. A tree came from an apple. Apple came from a tree all the way. Where did the first one come from? Had to come from something other than a tree or an apple, Right? And even if you're talking about, you know, you know, some other thing, it came from a different fruit. Okay, well, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Eventually, you have to answer the question with something created it to be. But God doesn't have that because God did, wasn't created. God is. And in order for anything to exist, something that always existed must have prior existed before everything else. And he exists. Okay. So, Elohim, uh, the 25 years of history prior to Moses have offered, remember I told you this, is, this book covers a period of history long before Moses was born, 25 plus years of, 2,500 years of history. God has offered more than enough evidence of his existence and doesn't need to answer questions like, well, where did you come from? Adam to Noah. Adam knew God in the garden. Adam knew what God, how he transgressed against God, how God made tunics of skin for him, how God cast him out of the garden. Adam knew God directly. No one needed to explain to, God, to Adam who God was. And then no one had to explain to Cain or Abel or Seth who God was. They had, they had personal direct knowledge of him. Noah and the flood and the three sons of Noah, you think they knew God existed? God who told Noah to build this incredible great big ark and then closed them in and told them beforehand, I'm going to make it rain on the earth for 40 days and for 40 nights and I'm going to destroy all living flesh that lives on it. You think they knew that God meant what he said and said what he meant? Right? Moses and, and then Abraham. Abraham, we're going to talk about Abraham when we get there. Abraham clearly knew God existed. And he trusted God. He had faith in God. He offered up his son Isaac, or was at least willing to. He believed and knew that God existed. Do you think Moses knew God existed? All the plagues of Egypt, all the manna in the wilderness that came out every single day, the pillar of fire by by night and the pillar cloud by day, and miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle. 
This group of people that Moses was writing to didn't need anybody to prove that God existed to them. So why bother, why bother with that information? Again, it's an unanswerable question. Our finite minds can't even begin to figure out who God is in terms of what, what, unless he tells us who he is and he's told us who he is. So, um, so Moses. So, and every person in Moses' audience, as I said, receiving this book would have known who God is with all of those miraculous signs and wonders. So the plural majesty of Elohim negates any possibility of polytheism, right? That plural majesty, singular noun, plural, ver- plural noun, singular verb. He is God and there is no other, which Isaiah 46, 9 says. I'm God, there is none like me, no, none other. Okay. So the immeasurable power of Elohim is on full display from the very first verse of the Bible. He has the power to create countless stars, some of which are incomprehensibly larger than our own sun, which is large enough to, our own sun is large enough to enclose one million Earth-sized planets. And he created all life and all matter that's contained in the universe. He's immeasurably powerful. He is God. And the immeasurable power of, I'm sorry, number three, he created a universe that can only be sustained by his eternal power like Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1 talk about. He created everything according to his will. He answers to no one regarding how, what, or why he has done what he has done. And Genesis 1-1 does not provide all of the attributes of who God is, this Elohim, but establishes enough information that man has not earned the right to question God. And I'm going to pause there or stop there for tonight because we're at the bottom of the hour. And I, I do want to look at Job and things like that here in a little bit. But hopefully that gets you started. We've got two words of Genesis 1-1 under our belts, or almost that. In the beginning, God. We'll pick up the rest next week. Have a wonderful week. And again, don't, anytime you have questions, please, let's ask, let's talk about it. Even debate, criticism, disagree, challenge, whatever it is, ask it as we go. Not tonight, because we're at the bottom of the hour, but... All the way through, ask if you have questions on any of this stuff. Thanks for coming. See you next week.